Yeah, I'm going to put this talk together. It's really a, uh, a assessment of the some of the things that the pros do to be successful in their careers. And I'll draw upon some of my personal experiences, and I'll draw upon some of my peers' experiences. But they're really more reminders more than anything else. This is not brain surgery. Some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about, say, oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and then some things you might say, of course I can do that. But the problem is with tennis players, we seem to get in the way a lot, and we uh, end up uh, hurting ourselves in some of our positions. So uh, I consider these just reminders. And uh, when I put down the uh, outline in the, that Pat asked me to present, I didn't put anything down. I just put down 40 spaces because I think as, as a professor at some of the universities, I like those and they write down things. I think they remember things better. However, if you're not a writer, you're just a listener, if you email me, uh, I will send you a copy of the PowerPoint. So let's get started. I'll try to go through these relatively quick and then maybe have a Q&A uh, to answer any questions you might have about operations or uh, life as a, as a, as a pro. Uh, the first one I have is you are always on display. And uh, a little comment on Reebok. I was the director of tennis at Atlanta Country Club for many years. And uh, I had one member there that used to take uh, an hour and a half lesson three days a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, great lesson. And uh, was able to make a lot of money on the one person. And at that time, I was sponsored by Reebok. And I remember one time I had worn a brand new pair of Reebok shoes to a lesson on Tuesday. And on Wednesday, I had a meeting with the general manager uh, early in the morning. So I had uh, wore business clothes. And I had forgotten my shoes. So when she came for a lesson, uh, I just went in my office and I had another pair of, of uh, Reebok shoes, uh, brand new Reebok shoes. Different model, but another another brand new pair. And on Thursday, I had a dentist appointment, so I got into the club after the dentist appointment. I had forgotten my shoes again, and I ended up going to the office. I had a third pair of Reebok shoes uh, that they had sent me. I, I wore them. At the at the end of the lesson on Thursday, she said, "Look, I have to I have to ask you a question." She goes, "Do you wear new shoes every single day?" <laughs> <laughs> and it occurred to me, how did she know this? Because the, the models were pretty similar. They were, just, they were like completely different. Colors. <laughs> they were just some different models. So the point that I'm, I'm making is members and clientele, customers, they scrutinize you. I mean, they, they, they look you over and you, you are always on display. And I think it's important for pros to understand. All tennis professionals are dispensable. Now, we like to think we're not dispensable. We think we do a good job, and, and, and of course we do. But I'll go back to my uh, tenure at Atlanta Country Club. I was there for about seven and a half years. I decided to make a career change. I had two little kids and I wanted to work in my house. So I started a promotion company and designed a club. And I had brought that club. It was a golf club. They, it was the home of the Bell South Golf Classic PGA Tour uh, event. So it was very, very much a golf club. And I had brought tennis up to a level that was quite respectable in the Atlanta area. So I'd done a pretty good job. At the end of the uh, seven and a half years, <coughs> I told them I was going to resign and everything. And they said, oh, great, great. And he said, can you recommend anybody to take your place? I said, well, I definitely will help you. <coughs> and uh, they, I remember them giving me a sweater for my seven and a half years and didn't even have the club logo on it. And, I, <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, I lived at this club for seven and a half years, and, I had, and they gave me this nice sweater that doesn't even have the club logo. And I can tell you, I still have that sweater in my closet, and I just look at it knowing <laughs> that, um, you know, you want to do a good job, but you, you're – in your members' and customers' eyes, you are replaceable. There, there's always someone good or better around the corner. So it's something to remember. If you don't have some kind of business ownership, you should always be looking over your shoulder. Now, that's that's kind of a scary thought because not, not many of us do have some kind of business ownership. But the reality is, if you don't have, if you don't own it, if you can't make a lot of the decisions. You are at the uh, the turn of, of your committees, as the general manager, I mean, they, whatever their favor is, they really call the shots. So if you can work out something, I always ask uh, a lot of the, the pros, when you negotiate your contract, see if you can get some kind of profit sharing line item in your contract. Uh, maybe it's based on hitting some numbers, so it's tied into profit margins of the club. If you can do that, then you're more uh, 
of a team player in that club and, and you really do have some kind of business ownership and you can um, make some better decisions. Identify your ally, allies on your board, club boards, and tennis committees. Tennis committees can uh, make you and break you. Now we all uh, we all work with some committees, and some are easy to work with. If you can pick your own <coughs> committees, we're fortunate. Sometimes we can't, and sometimes we have to make some very hard decisions. Uh, I know several of my peers that uh, one one director would not put. Uh, he was asked by the general manager to. Uh, put one of the ladies of the club on a special on one of the level teams and she was not at that ability level he wouldn't do it and when that lady's husband became a board member and one of the first things he did was fire the program. Uh, those things happen and it's unfortunate but, but we have to we have to look at those. Another uh, friend of mine uh, ran some junior tournaments uh, and he had a big junior program and for the club championships GM called him in the office and said, look, uh, I see the C's of your, of your juniors here, and you didn't see so-and-so. And the uh, father came in and said, look, he needs to be seated. He's a great player. And uh, the, the director said, no, I can't do that. He's not, he's not as good as he thinks. He didn't see them. That father became uh, a board member and fired the program. Uh, I mean, that sounds <coughs> shallow, but it exists. Uh, so the, the answer is, know who, who's on your club boards. Uh, Get to know them uh, so that you can relate to them and you can make sure that uh, they understand some of your integrity that you have to, to, to use during your, uh, your tenure at the club. Do not attempt to conspicuously live the lifestyle of your membership. I see this a lot at country clubs. Uh, everybody wants to do well, and, and some of the jobs out there are, are quite lucrative. You can make a very, very good living. And Atlanta Country Club, we had a golf pro there who was a master uh, PGA pro. He had been there for 25 years. And he was the guy. I mean, he was the guy around the country that everybody would, would uh, read about in magazine articles, etc. And I was studying this guy. I actually, I actually happened to have lunch when I got to the club because I wanted to learn what he was doing to be so, so successful. And he would always drive this old, beat-up, yellow Volkswagen to the club. And his club was a high-end club. I mean, there was every high-end car in the parking lot every day. And but you'd always know he's there because you'd pick out this ugly yellow Volkswagen, you'd see it there in the parking lot, and it'd be lined up next to all the, the Mercedes and Lexus. So I said, what? I know you're making a ton of money. The guy owns a pro shop, he had a big some of concessions. I said, what? Why do you drive this car? And he goes, because to let the members know I'm not at that their social level. They, if they knew that, they would not support me the same way. And uh, he goes, by the way, I, I have a Mercedes in my garage. <laughs> and my wife has a Mercedes as well. And I was thinking, this guy knows how to work with his membership, and, and I'll never forget them. I think that that makes uh, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Romantic encounters can occur <coughs> a long road, and I'm talking about encounters with your constituency, clubs, and facilities. Uh, you have to think that if for some reason if it, if it goes bad, you still got to see these people on a regular basis. And, uh, and of course, it, uh, it starts a lot of rumors, and, and you, you really can't uh, wait with that. <coughs> if you're only seen wearing tennis apparel, you will never be taken seriously. I believe that. I would make it a point that if I went to a uh, board of directors meeting for the club, in fact, sometimes I was not invited to the board of directors meetings. I would ask, and I tend to sit in the back just to hear what's going on, and I would wear business attire, coat tie, um, to those meetings, <coughs> and I'd see these, these members looking like, who, who this guy in the back? Oh, he's a tenant. He's a tennis director. And they look at him, and they look at me twice because they're used to seeing tennis players. But th they look at people differently <coughs> when you're dressed differently. They, when, when you're wearing tennis shorts, their view of you is, oh, you're having fun. You're out there in the sun and, and it's a great time. It's hard work. Tennis, ten teaching tennis is hard work, especially if you're going <coughs> hour after hour after hour. They don't see that. They only see their time there and they, they think that you're having a great time and you may be, but um, you want to make sure that they see that you are a business person as well and that helps your longevity 
be a jack of all trades versus a master of one. I go to, uh, I look at people who apply for positions, and I, I've hired a lot of people, and I've consulted with a lot of people for hiring. And a lot of clubs will have someone as a director or head pro who, let's say, is an excellent uh, adult ladies uh, league coach, uh, does clinics well, and, and is a master of putting all the programs together. And then the club says, well, you know, our junior program doesn't is not very good. We need to hire a junior expert. So the next person they look for, they, they want that person to be an expert in, in just juniors. And then, the, then it's a cycle. The, the junior program goes up, the ladies program uh, goes down, and then the next person is looking for to hire another adult ladies expert. So my, my comment is you need to have some qualities in each one of these. Uh, all your programs need to, to be successful. And if you're known as just one, then I think you're pigeonholed. Now, there are positions out there that they hire just for one expertise. I think that's fine. But if you're looking to go into a, a, a facility where you're running the whole show and uh, you need to have expertise in many areas, I think it's important to, to have that expertise. Work with your general manager, not against him or her. Your general manager could be your best asset or your worst nightmare. Uh, general managers look at tennis pros very differently. <coughs> I have to say, we had the CMAA panel discussion in Charlotte uh, last year for the Southern Convention. And one of the GMs we brought in, who was one of the, uh, the managers for one of the Trump properties, he made a great comment. He said, the tennis directors have it much tougher than the, the uh, golf because the golf directors, they, they work with their the membership for a few minutes at the pro shop, then the members go out and they're on the golf course for six hours, and then they come in, they go into the, uh, the bar. But the tennis guys have to interact with the tennis membership on all day long. You're, you're talking to members and working with the tennis people all day long, and it's a much more difficult um, position. I have never heard a general manager say that before, so, uh, and I agree with that. The, gen the general manager, you need to teach your general manager <coughs> some of your qualities of the program so that uh, uh, they'll be on your side because they can, they can be your worst enemy. Some of the things that, I, that I've done I think were successful, I would offer free lessons uh, for employee benefit. For example, the club may have uh, an employee of the month and I would say, okay, so you select your employee of the month, the entire club, we have 200 members, 200 employees of the club and I'll give them a free lesson. Uh, and it makes the club manager look good uh, because they think they're getting left the, the perk from the general manager because he's the one selling it, but I'm the one doing the work. Uh, but it makes the general manager look pretty good. Uh, I've also done some things where I've done some round robins for all the vendors of the uh, food and beverage department at the, at the uh, club. So the club has all these vendors, the, uh, the uniform vendors, the dish <coughs> vendors, the food vendors, and we invite them all to a round robin tennis event that I put on, and uh, a lot of times the general manager's profit is based on uh, whether the club does well or not. They're making more money if the club's profitable. So here I am working with his vendors so he gets some better deals, so he makes more money, so now I've got a nice relationship with the general manager. And I think that's very, very important. Um, you don't want to uh, never see or meet with your general manager. And if your general manager is the kind of type that doesn't meet with you, you need to reach out to them and say, look, uh, I'd like to sit down with you every other week, or uh, let's, let's go over uh, any potential problems or troubleshoot our, our programs and sit down with them whenever you can so that they know that you have an interest in, and you can be uh, a great asset to them. You are a hero to many, and make sure you act like one. Um, we, we touch so many lives. You don't realize, especially with the kids, you don't realize uh, how you, you in, how you influence those those kids. I look at one family I used to teach. I used to teach. They had three kids, so I used to teach all three kids. I would <coughs> teach the uh, the wife in the ladies' clinics, and then the the, uh, the husband uh, would teach in the men's clinics. So the whole family used to take lessons. And one time, uh, I was talking to them as a group, and they they made the comment, uh, you know. Last night, 
we were discussing some of the uh, things you said in this lesson, this lesson, at the dinner table. And I'm thinking, these folks are talking about me at their dinner table? I mean, I'm just a tennis pro. But you touch each one of them, and you, and you are a subject of their lives. It's, it's, it's interesting to see how you affect everybody. And we, we're very, very fortunate in our profession to, to be able to do that. Um, and especially for the kids, we, those kids want to be like us. Uh, if, you, if you ever run a pro-am uh, and you invite the members to come to a pro-am, they want to rub elbows with the pros, just like here, just like this tournament. Um, it, it's, it makes them feel good. So you are a hero, but make sure you don't disappoint them. And that, it goes, this is the same point, I think. You influence, influence more lives than you think. Um, how many of you have, have put a racket in, in the kid's hand to start, and they go up and, and uh, move up the ranks, and they, they end up playing college tennis? Anybody's done that? Uh, plenty of people. Um, those people remember what you've done for them through the rest of their lives. It's a, it's a, it's, I think, humbling to, to think about how um, you can uh, direct some of their, their uh, uh, things they do in their lives. But, and then they have kids, it's the same thing, and you're influencing them. So uh, be that, uh, that hero to them. Treat your fellow department heads with respect. And, and I say this because sometimes when a, when a pro comes into a facility, you know, they, they have a high, tennis pros have high egos, I mean, let's face it, we all have high egos. And they, they become, uh, they put themselves up on a pedestal, they don't want to talk to the maintenance people, they don't want to talk to the, the servers. Uh, and it's important to interact with all those people because those people uh, can help you. And one of the things that I remember hearing, uh, the servers, I used to give a free clinic to all the employees, especially the, all the servers, come out on a Sunday afternoon and something we do on a regular basis, so it's not really hard work, and they love it, they get a free, free perk. But I remember one uh, one of the servers was telling me, oh yeah, this member was saying this and this, because they're serving the members at the di at the dining room, and they're hearing a lot of the, the uh, stuff that goes on, and they, they were reporting some of it. Hey, just be careful, because this member said this, and, and uh, they're looking to do this, and I wanted to give you a heads up on this. Uh, I thought that was kind of neat, but I would not have had that relationship unless I, I treated all the some respect to all the employees. <coughs> Start an IRA or self-retirement plan as soon as possible. And if you are under 30, that's probably the most valuable information you will ever get um, at this, at this uh, seminar for sure. Uh, because time is your friend and uh, time equals money if you can uh, if you can start that right away. I think that is so important. And you know, tennis pros, we forget to do that. We run a lot of cash money through, through our business, but a lot of times we just don't take care of ourselves. Um, I, I've heard people say, uh, pay yourself first, and I think that's, that's important. If you, if you are just, uh, if the club is not paying you a salary, then pay yourself a salary from your lessons and put that in some separate envelope or account where um, you're making money on a regular basis you can depend on for a rainy day. Uh, one of my first jobs was language and innuendos. You know, sometimes you want to be one of the good old boys uh, with your members. But you have to be careful. Um, and a lot of times <coughs> you, you get baited by your members. You know, they want, they, they'll test you. They'll, they'll say a, a risque joke or something to see how you handle it. Um, <coughs> and I just, my, my reminder to everyone is just be careful because uh, you don't want to be This is probably one of the biggest weaknesses we have. <coughs> you need to learn how to read budgets and how to relate to percentages because that's how
how business works. Business is not so much gross dollars as much as it is percentages. Oh, <coughs> lessons are up 3%. Food and beverages is up 4%, 5%. Uh, how much were we up last month at this time? And there's a variance in there. So you're either plus or minus variance for that month. And I would recommend that you start keeping some, even if it's your own business and you're doing <laughs> Maybe you're doing straining, maybe you're doing just lessons or, or uh, apparel sales or, or racket sales, whatever it is. Start getting data because you can't <coughs> measure it, you cannot improve it. Uh, that is one of the, the best sayings of business, and you need to be able to look at it from the same point, either a month ago or a year and a month ago, so you know where to go. Also, when you go for raises or when you talk to people to help your own business, when you build your own resume, talk in percentages because that's what people understand. I built the program and, and we, we increased junior participation by 48%. That's, a, that's an impressive number and you need to be able to track it. Do what you say and say only what you do. If, uh, if you say that you qualified for the main draw of Wimbledon and you never went to Wimbledon, don't start telling your publisher uh, some fairy tales because it, it only comes out to hurt you. And that, I see that over and over again. That, that's what I mean when I say test professionals sometimes <coughs> get in their own way. Do not become a desk jockey. Does anybody know what a desk jockey is? Uh, those that are directors or tennis pros or even general managers, where they like to stay in their office behind the desk, you need to get out and interact with tell you what, you go, you watch some ladies playing on, on court 11, and you walk down there, and you make a comment that, uh, hey, that was a good serve, but, uh, you know, maybe you need to put it down the tee so your partner can help poach on that next, just that one little comment, they love it, and, and it shows them that you care, and you're out interacting with, with the, uh, the customers, it makes a big difference, so we want, you want to make sure that you're not, you know, maybe you have a lot of responsibilities, and you have to do a lot of work behind them office. You need to get out or have some face time. There's a, uh, there's a pro down at a very exclusive club in Florida, and uh, he's not allowed to teach lessons. He's not allowed to do that. It's a big program. He has uh, almost 18 pros work there. Uh, big facility. And he's not allowed to teach one lesson. His job is to walk the facility all day long and interact with the members. And he makes a lot of money to, to do that. So it, it it's an important feature to, to add to your own repertoire. Networking is the key to your future. Meet people, talk to people, get their business cards, stay in contact. You just don't know where, where it leads. And uh, often, uh, you know that old saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And maybe that's not very fair, but there's a lot of truth to that. So. back to that one saying, <coughs> same people you see climbing up the ladder, you see going down the ladder. You want to make sure that you keep your network as, as, uh, as big as possible. And of course, you know, through, through Facebook or LinkedIn, you can, you can do that uh, relatively easily. Take the time to be visible to all your stakeholders of your tennis programs. <coughs> so the CTCC stands for Cherokee Town Country Club. There was a gentleman who was the director of Georgia Maya One of the biggest clubs in the in Atlanta area, very lucrative position. And he told the story one time that he was called in by the, uh, a general manager saying, "Look, a member came in and said he he asked, where's the tennis director? I never see. I'm here every Thursday night playing at nine o'clock every Thursday night, and I have yet to even meet the tennis director." Well, George would work Monday through Wednesday up until nine o'clock. Um, and then on that Thursday, he would only work to 6 o'clock, and then he'd work to 9 o'clock on, on Friday and work half a day on Saturday and half Sunday on I mean, So he was there all the time. Yet here he is being chastised because a member thinks the guy's never even there. So it's that impression that uh, 
you have to be fair to everybody. So if, if, if that's your schedule, then you need to rotate your schedule so that you see all the constituencies of your club members. Because some of them will uh, will think that, hey, this, uh, how, where are we paying this guy? I never even see him. I'm here every single week. It just may not be the right time that you're, you're there. So rotate your schedule so that you touch everybody. Don't gouge the uninformed. You know, sometimes someone takes up tennis. Oh yeah, we can uh, sell you this two hundred fifty dollar racket and uh, the best guts, the best strength. Let's put some gut in it. And the person just picking up tennis. And then they, they, two years later, they're they're now a much stronger player. Yeah, I don't know why this pro gave me all this great equipment when I was just starting. I could have could have worked my way up into it. And you you get a bad rap for that. So uh, it comes back to, to, to hurt you. So you want to be fair to everybody. Personal hygiene is more important than you think. You know, when you're talking, you're, you're next to people a lot. So if you have dirt under your nails, or you're not brushing your teeth on a regular basis, uh, that stuff uh, comes back. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, you don't give people a reason to go someplace else. You must learn to be and look like an expert at beating. I, I, and I, this is one of my big points. Uh, you can look down a court, many of you can, you look down a court of six or seven pros teaching. And you can you can see in your mind who's a competent teacher based on how they feed. And if, if, if you're not good at it, then you need to practice that so that you become uh, credible because the customers can see it as well. I mean, it's not easy to, it's not difficult to pick out uh, where people are using when they're feeding and how much spin is on the ball and where the ball is bouncing most of the time and if you're making it difficult or hard for your, for your customers. And, and as you know, we can make our customers look like champions and we can make them look foolish based on feeding. So uh, you want to make sure that you do become an expert in feeding. Become entrepreneurial. So the old saying is, if you want to raise, teach nonetheless. Well, that's nice, but it's a lot more work. Uh, see if you can't branch out to some extra uh, entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial uh, programs, concessions, uh, consulting. There's a, a gentleman that, that ran a big public center with 24 courts. He had six pros working for him. And uh, he told me that his biggest line item for income was the uh, soda machine, uh, the soda fountain machine sets. That's where he made most of his money. And, he's, and he, had, he had six pros working for him. So there's a lot of ways to make money in this business. Another, another uh, friend of mine, he, it was, he, had, uh, he would teach at a club that was very, very hot. And during the summer, he invested in... Uh, one of those uh, icing machines. I think it's what they call the uh, different flavored icings. Mm -hmm. Cost them 200 bucks. He sold them for, he sold the icing for two bucks a piece. I said, how much money have you had? He said, well, the cup cost me six cents. And he had, he had like 11 cents in it. And, and uh, he would sell an icy for two bucks. And during the summer, every kid in this program would play tennis and, and drink icy. He made uh, he made a lot of extra money on that. So you know if, it, if you if it's something where your club has to improve it, see if you can go into business with them and have some kind of uh, share <coughs> of profit with them. But there are many ways for us to increase our our, uh, our revenues. Invest in yourself. Sometimes we don't want to put any money into it. If we have a pro shop or if we have the ability. String rackets, or we want to get in as cheap as possible. Uh, I think it's important to show that you're an expert. If, if you are the string at your club, go ahead and join the USRSA. You'll become an, an MRT. Uh, you can charge more for that. There's a fellow up in Pennsylvania that uh, he bought a, uh, a racket customization machine, one of the uh, RDC, Babylon RDCs. Four grand, but he would charge 
members, uh, I think it was 45 bucks a year uh, to customize their rackets, whenever they wanted to. They, they had two rackets come in, and we'll see what the pound pressure is, or we'll try to weight them so they, they're the same. And it was 45 bucks a year, so the, 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 it was just another item on their bill. We had a thousand members. So he told me he put his kids through school 45 grand a year for this customization machine. It cost him four grand, and uh, it wasn't very difficult to do. He didn't spend a lot of time on it, but it was a great way <coughs> to, uh, to make an extra uh, 45 grand uh, with a very minimal investment. And also I look at, you know, the, you look at stringing machines. You know, you can buy a stringing machine that costs 800 bucks, or you can buy one that costs uh, 3,500 bucks. You know, the, uh, you know, when I moved to Point Mallet Park, uh, I set up a stringing corner, and uh, you know, I have a customization machine there, I have the electronic prints machine, I've got all the lights on it, I have all the strings <coughs> hanging up around it, and it, it, looks, uh, it looks fairly elegant. Um, and, and when you do that, all of a sudden people think that you're, you're more credible. And they, they can, there's a lot of options where they can go to get their racket strong. But if they have faith in you, they believe in that you know what you're, what you're doing, they, they will uh, uh, support you. So, so I think that's important rather than trying to do something out of the trunk of your car. And I see a lot of pros try to do that. Um, it seems to me like it's, a, it's an easy way out. USPTA resources, we're members, and we have this organization that has a lot of benefits, but I would bet that over half of you have not been to the benefit page of the USPTA website to see all the different things we, we offer. And we offer a lot. There's a lot of uh, drills, templates, uh, programs that you can implement in your lessons. Tap into it. It's there. It's free. It's part of your membership. Personal websites. If you, don't have your, if you haven't updated your personal website, uh, that's not just for you or your members. It's good for your uh, board of directors. You know, you, sh you share it to your board of directors. Look, this is what I'm doing for our club. I have this information on our, our personal website. It makes you look a little more credible, and it doesn't cost you anything. It just costs you your dues, but it's an extra free uh, benefit. There's quite a few of those resources online. Just see what they are, and then tap into the ones you want. Find a mentor and study with him and her because they have already made the mistakes. And I can tell you that uh, I have made my share of mistakes, that's for sure. Uh, find someone who will work with you, <coughs> who, who you can have a, 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 a business relationship with, who can help you go through the career path to where you want to go. One of the things about tennis pros is that we're giving people. I mean, that's all we do is, is give back. We give back more than any profession, I think. But, again, we're sometimes afraid to ask uh, some of the people that have been in the business for a long time. Reach out. You'll find that they want to help. Uh, keeps them involved, and it's going to help you. <laughs> <Not the competition>. <laughs> <laughs> I like golf. I'm not very good at it. I was at was in Metro DC, it was a high end club. And one of the things they said to me was, you know, we're gonna give you a membership. Oh, wow, that's nice. You know, so, so the initiation fee was a hundred thousand dollars. So so what? I'm not gonna be able to use it. <laughs> I'm not gonna go sit, eat in the dining room. I'm not gonna go out on the golf course with the members, because as soon as you do that, whether they uh, give you a membership or not, in some members' eyes, doing out here. They, he's not working on the travelers. So you want to make sure that um, you're very careful taking advantage of some of the parts that they give you. Um, my recommendation is <coughs> if you're going to negotiate anything, negotiate with a different club and a different pro. So, hey, that pro can use my golf course and I can use their golf course so you're not looking at the same membership. But it's a little bit easier sell if, uh, if you really have that addiction to play golf. Um, but be careful because that you're putting an impression in members' eyes, and members want to play with you. They'll ask you, "Hey, come out. We need a four, some fill up or some." And uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave it up to everybody whether you do that or not. But I just don't see any benefit in it because 
Sanders get that impression? And uh, I do think it comes back to uh, hurt you. The tennis industry is changing. And if you're not changing, you're going to be left behind. We all have our own way of doing things. I know that I've become accustomed to do certain things certain ways. If I don't modify, if I don't adapt, you're not going to move up. There's too much. There are too many new things that are going on in our industry. Um, if you're not taking, the, if you're not reading Tennis Industry magazine to see what's new and what's happening and, and what new programs are out there, and you're not accepting some of them, or maybe your your um, your belief is that they're not very good. I need to do it one way. We still need to offer some things so that the your your clientele sees that you're up to date, uh, and you need to become knowledgeable. So, yeah, if you're good at one thing, exploit it. But don't uh, turn your back on everything because uh, it changes too fast. It changes too fast. Don't wing it. Have a short list of prepared lesson plans. I always take a, a business card with me on the court. You know, on the back of the business card, I list four or five drills I'm going to use for a play. And sometimes I get. I can't see it without glasses, so sometimes in the middle of the lesson, we'll pick it up all and take my glasses and I'll take them up to the business card. And the ladies go, what, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm just looking at my lesson plan. Do you have a lesson plan? I said, yes, I don't, I, I don't come in unprepared. Every time I'm on the court, I have some kind of itinerary or agenda to follow. And not only does it help me perform better, but I can start getting a better record and I'm not repeating certain things week to week. And customers appreciate it. Again, it doesn't have to be a, a, a typewritten, outline uh, lesson plan. Just a few notes to make sure that you know that what you're doing and you have a path uh, how to finish the lesson. People and members want you to succeed, and give them, so give them the opportunity <coughs> to help you, but retain control. Uh, there is a lot of uh, quid pro quo out there. Hey, we, you know, we can do this for you, but be careful about this. And uh, and actually, this position I'm in now, I kind of fell into the problem where we had one. Uh, I'm at a public park. It's a public park and rec. So there's not there's not a lot of private clubs around. So there's a lot of tennis there. And there's one a very successful family that helped uh, put some money into building extra courts. We have a tennis bubble over a couple of hard courts. They kind of funded that. But for that, you know, they kind of want special privileges. And the rest of the, the, the constituencies, the taxpayers, they, they're paying taxes. They want the same privileges. And you have to be careful that you don't uh, let someone uh, help you with the price tag. And I say that. Uh, <coughs> very carefully because people will find out. The public is not stupid. And they, see, they ask questions. Why is this person always getting this court? Or why is this person, uh, how come I can't ever reserve this court and this person is always on it? And they just put two and two together. So you have to be careful. And we want to get, people want to help you, but you got to give, give that impression that uh, <coughs> you're fair. And they will respect you for being fair. Know the names and faces. Uh, people become offended if you shun them. Uh, I do a lot of testing for the USPA, or not as much anymore, but I used to do an awful lot of testing. And I remember <coughs> one uh, lesson that, that I was critiquing. At the end of the lesson, we asked the students for some feedback. And we usually ask, uh, uh, what do you think about that lesson? Would you, would you pay for that lesson? Uh, can you give me a couple of uh, things you, you learned from that lesson? So I asked those same questions, and this one guy, uh, the guy gave the student, the applicant gave a pretty good lesson. I thought it was a, a P1 lesson. He did everything he's supposed to do. But this guy was so upset at the end of the lesson. I said, what's the matter? He goes, when he called me James, my name is Joe, and he called me James for the entire lesson. And this, that really offended him. <laughs> and, I, and, you know, I, I'm thinking, big deal, you know, you, you only, <laughs> you're only on the court for 25 minutes. But for him, it was a big deal. So uh, 
point I'm making is, is uh, get to know some names and faces. All member lessons are important. Be careful to not show obvious favoritism to your greatest lesson takers, and we tend to do that because they're adding money to our account. Because when they leave, you will go broke. And sometimes people find a greener pasture, they want to try a different pro, and if you put all your eggs in one basket, it, it, uh, it can hurt you later on. So you want to make sure you're treating everybody carefully. One of the first jobs I took at a, at a commercial facility, I was trying to build up my lesson cl uh, clientele, and uh, so when people came in to take lessons, I, I would always go over 10, 15 minutes of lessons and trying to give them value. And then, I, then my lesson book got pretty Packed and I was doing lesson to lesson to lesson, so I was stopping more timely. And I had one person come in and say, You gave Mary an extra 15 minutes. Well, how come you don't give me an extra 15 minutes? And people start thinking, start looking at it. So you have to be careful not to show that favoritism and making sure you treat people the same. Have faith in your value and work as a tennis professional. The, uh, the comment I have there is there was a cartoon caricature in the uh, Wall Street Journal one time, and it was a contractor, a guy uh, with a hard hat on and uh, a construction type person in a, in a caricature, and he was standing there with his pockets hanging out, mm -hmm. empty pockets, and the, the caption on it was, I won every bid that I bid on last year. Point is, he didn't make any money because he underbid everything, and, and he bid it well below the value just because he got the bid doesn't mean he's making money. You need to have faith in what you're worth. Uh, I have actually gone to a point where if I didn't want to teach as much, I'd raise my rates. There are people who, who are going to pay it regardless. Some, and then, but also have other options for them to go to if they don't want to go to, to <coughs> what I set up. But the thing that I have mostly with this, I had one gentleman that would take a two-hour lesson four days a week. And I was charging 100 bucks an hour at that time. So this guy was paying me a fortune, a small fortune, every week. And it was always from 7 to 9 a.m. So I was there early, I would get that lesson in. Uh, 200 bucks, 200 bucks, 800 bucks a week. So finally, I've been doing that for a year. And he comes in and he goes, you know what? I think I should get the first three days pay you and that the fourth day should be free. I said, well, my lesson rate is $100 an hour. And he goes, well, I just met with my accountant and he said that I paid you $40,000 last year. And I, <laughs> I don't think that's fair. <laughs> I said, well, did you reach a certain level? And th this is the guy that we, we got him to play. Uh, he went over to uh, Israel and competed in, in some of the Olympic games and he got to a great level. And I helped him get there. I said, I think you should be pretty happy where, where you've gotten to. And, uh, and, and frankly, if you don't want to take the time, I'll, I'll sell to someone else. And he looked at me like this. And he said, okay. And he ended up still paying with money. <laughs> so I just stuck to the state, I stayed with my guns. But you have to have faith in what you, you know, we all, we're good at it. You're, you're good at what you do. You need to let people know that you know you're good at it. And, uh, and then let the market work. Become competent with every level of player, from 2.0 ladies to junior tournament players. And again, that kind of goes back to, to pigeonholing yourself. You, you don't have to be, um, you know, so, so many of us want to work with the junior players, with the top junior players, because they're, they're, they're fun to work with. Uh, but we probably make more money for the lower levels, and we need to show our, our uh, customer base that we're good at every, every different level. And you become the expert. Respect the tennis manufacturers. You know, we just see too many pros trying to double dip or, uh, or selling their soul for product. And, uh, you know, everybody's trying to make money, and you got to be fair. And if you stay in the business long enough uh, and you do not respect the tennis manufacturers, you're not going to have many friends in the business. Teach your membership how they should treat you. And I think that's not just membership, that's just life. You teach people how to treat you. Everybody has their own gauge of integrity and, 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 uh, and how you, you operate. Just make sure that you don't undersell yourself. And you 
let let the your, whoever your contacts are know that hey, this is this is my character, and this is what you expect from me, and then they can choose to accept that or not. But if you don't, if you're always changing because someone asks you to do something, oh yeah, I'll end up doing that, and that's not in your best interest. And you, you're the one who loses, and you need to. I think a lot of that is about self-respect. You need to have self-respect. Educate your GM and tennis committee members. They don't understand our business, and they have the wrong impression of tennis professionals. Um, you know, again, I go back to the things that we're always having fun. With. You know, when, when we're out teaching and, and moving and hitting hitting balls all day long, that can be pretty physical. And uh, you know, to them, well. Get some great exercise. That's nice, <laughs> uh, but they also don't understand that you're, you're dealing with not just teaching tennis. Uh, people come to you and they're, they're, they're confiding in you, and, and uh, you become a uh, all. You wear all these hats. You become a part-time psychologist and a sports science person, and, and you're helping them in so many different areas. But uh, most of the GMs, they see everything in the eyes of the golf. Always go through the proper chain of command. Uh, you know, sometimes you're going to have some you run into some roadblocks, and and I would recommend that you go through your next supervisor to next supervisor. And if it needs to go all the way up to to the end, it'll get there. But you don't want to jump ship and go over somebody because I think that will hurt your tenure at a facility. If you have a family, always remember your job is your job, and you need to leave time for your family. Uh, tennis pros have one of the highest rates of divorce because we're married to the club a lot. Uh, we, and you need to make sure that you leave time for your family. Because, again, some of us are very, very committed to our jobs. But you know, think of it, it's a job. There's a lot of jobs out there. Always have another member when you are discussing the enforcement of policy. So sometimes, if you're a director of a club or a head pro, sometimes you have to be the hatchet person to enforce policies. And if that's the case, you've got to sit down with a with a member to say, hey, you know, why'd you do this? You can't handle that that way. I would always have another member or a staff person with you because if you, otherwise it becomes a said. I would also recommend that if you're working with staff people and you have any problems, develop a council form and keep a record of, uh, of everything that happens with possible solutions. Uh, at one club I was at, I had uh, had to fire a uh, one of the maintenance guys, and he sued me. So I had to go to court, and I brought all these council forms that I had shown that he had a history of problems, and I tried to help him. And uh, it worked out that way, um, and I was unfortunate to win that case because I had this this uh, information. So uh, even though it's a little bit extra work, it will help. It's your best interest to always handle matters diplomatically and treat members the same. I go back to that same thing. You know, there are people that help us more than others, and there are some people that don't give us the time of day. But if you if you have that reputation that that you are a fair person. That's where you will get your respect. Um, and I think that helps you when you move to other positions. If you, if you interview with other jobs and, and you end up, uh, uh, your reputation follows you, I guess is what I'm saying. And I think that helps you uh, to better yourself. So where, what I'm thinking here is that uh, as a tennis pro, we have one of the hardest jobs there is because uh, it's not only physical, mental, uh, dealing with, with Customers is always in the people business is always difficult, but we're very fortunate. We uh, the rewards are great, and uh, we do impact so many lives. Uh, when I look back on all the all the people that I helped in tennis, and then also personal lives, you know, they, that, that it just overruns, and, and really uh, it really affects a lot of people. So it, it is a lifetime of satisfaction. I hope everybody uh, continues to do that. I'll take a couple of questions, but if you want, if you want a copy of this, uh, and, and 
again, this is not brain surgery, but it's, I think it's good to get some of these reminders. If we are career pros and want to stay in the business, so if you email me at uh, tom.tagless at gmail.com, I will send you a copy of this if you're familiar with this. So let me open it up for, for any, uh, any questions on any other problems with the club or staff or manager or anything I can help you with. Is I just think women are a lot better at teaching women for some reason, but um, <coughs> um, the, the juggling of, um, of maybe being too forceful with certain people and not forceful with another one. I don't have that many teams, but I, I, have, I kind of have a conflict with, uh, in particular, this one team I have, the, the captain of the team, uh, she says I'm too hard, but the rest of the team really appreciate what I'm doing, but you got the captain. You know, I mean, how you know how to juggle that? You know? Yeah, I, I I would sometimes ask people <coughs> directly, what what's your expectation of the lesson? And sometimes people are gonna say, well, you know, we just want to work out. And and sometimes they'll say, uh, you know, you're not giving us enough strategy, whatever it is. But I would ask them right off the bat, what's your expectation? And I would do it as a group. So if you have one person that is the loner between the other three or four that person will kind of go with the flow because the whole group is asking for that expectation. So I, I think I would do it in a group format. Um, and then usually, even though she's the captain, uh, she'll, she'll go with the rest of the group what they want. And, uh, and then also, you, you, there are private lessons available if there are certain things that they want to work on differently. And I think uh, as far as the women pros, um, there's, there's a demand for women pros. When I was teaching PTN programs, first people that I would get summer positions were the, were the uh, women. I mean, there's so many pros that want women pros because they think they relate better with the ladies groups, and a lot of them do. Um, so if you, are, if you are female, there is a future in this business for sure. <laughs> yes, I was sir. just going to ask uh, uh, any comments regarding uh, the pros family using the facility where you work. I don't know if you have any, like, because I know that creates problems. Yeah, it, it, it does create problems. And, and I, at one club I was offered, uh, my family can use the pool. And so I, a couple times, it's a nice country club, I had them come out and use the pool. And I'm seeing, you know, they, 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 it was awkward for them because the members would see that they are, you know, are you members here? And no, I, my, uh, my husband's the, the, the pro. <coughs> They, they weren't accepted very well, so we stopped doing it, and uh, and we went someplace else. And I just didn't think it was a hassle, but I think you got to feel that out and, and take it for, for how you, the, the clientele you have. Some people are more receptive than others, and some are, you know, some country clubs are pretty snooty; they don't want anybody but <laughs> but their members uh, around. So uh, I think it's a it's a careful type of you have to you have to walk. Another thing, Tom, regarding the <coughs> women pros. At our facility, we've attempted to hire women pros, as in everybody else probably. And we've had uh, one successful hire that lasted maybe a one year and a half, and then uh, she was doing great. But one of the things that I've noticed that uh, women don't like, I mean, some of our job includes some maintenance duties and some just physical work, like just lifting a bucket of water, fill, it, fill, it, fill up a, a, a water jug or something like that. Uh, and I know for a fact a couple of our uh, girls that we hired quit because of that. Yeah. And I'm thinking that uh, if there was a, a way to, I don't know, at least make <coughs> everybody aware that if we're going to hire a woman, we need to not make her accountable for some of those duties. I don't know. Do you I don't know. There's some women pros here. They can probably I'm speak for themselves. Only, <laughs> I'm laughing only because i got an 18 core facility and I'm the director. And I do all of those things. So if, if one of my female pros came up to me and said, I can't do something, I mean, that would just be no. ridiculous. I, I'm sorry, but that's just me. And I, I worked at other facilities as uh, <laughs> instructors. And I did, I pulled the courts, I lined the courts, I did, you know, we, we put down all the lines on the courts. We relined them all. So to me, that's ridiculous. But I, I have a different attitude on work than most newer generation people. I think there's no offense to young people, but. Uh, yeah. But as far as the females go, I've got just the opposite problem. That he's, I find that I'm harder on the females than the guys are because they tend to give them more compliments 
and more fluff. No, not, I mean, it's just, that's just how it is. Whether it be, whether it be, and I'm in a public facility, but uh, I'm right, I'm, I'm very sarcastic, but I'm telling, you know, in personal invitation, get your butt to the net. You know, just, why aren't you up there? You know, you gotta move, you gotta get through that zone. And they find the guys to be a little bit nicer about it, I guess, and I guess because I don't feel like I need to compliment them because I haven't been brought up saying, oh, well, you know, she's a lady, you gotta compliment. That's, you know, <laughs> obviously I wasn't told that. So I just find it a little bit different and coming from the female side of it is that um, I can relate to a lot of the women and um, especially, you know, the beginner players and all, but, you know, once they got a couple classes in, I'm not, I'm not holding back. Yeah, I think that's, if, if, if you're a female teaching the guys, um, <laughs> To, you need to be a little forceful. I think I agree with that. I think you need to, to uh, let them know where you stand <laughs> because you know you can be pushed around and you don't want to be pushed around at all. Uh, as far, but what the gentleman mentioned about um, job descriptions, before you hire anybody, all that stuff needs to be listed in job descriptions so it's, it's, it's disclosed, they know exactly what you're getting into, and then just like anybody else, really good stuff. Okay, yes. <laughs> I, I think one of the greatest things that she presented today, and it was on the tail end of this, is ask an individual player in a lesson or a clinic, what are your expectations? I think that's one of the biggest things that I'm going to leave here with because then you can say, okay, this is what you want, this is what I intend to do, and you can document it, and you can go back to that and say, but on such and such, you said that, and, and I think that's really great advice, really good advice. You, you know, for a, children, a, a, a lot of pros will, before season starts, they'll ask, what's your expectations for the season? And they'll have the, the people write it out. And then you have something in your hands so <laughs> that something goes wrong. You say, well, look, you said you wanted this, 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 and this is what we covered. So you're giving them what they asked for. Sometimes you can't win no matter what you do, but it's a good it's a good resource, I think. Yes, sir. You know, one of the things, uh, is, I, was, I was thinking of different things that come up over the years, of texting and emails. I learned one. I learned the hard way one time. I know we, I have to do it. I'm sure everybody else has to do it. But I sent out a text one time to a group of ladies, and I thought it sounded one way, and it came out the other way. And, and I think maybe a, to add to one of those things, that was a huge deal. And uh, when I'm asking my wife, I said, "What does this sound like to you?" And I was like, "Really?" I mean, I just couldn't see out. But I know so they don't see my they don't see my my. Uh, the, Flexations and my voice, all that, and there, in that email or that text, it came out one way. And anyway, I just now I read them. And if I have any questions, I say, hey, "What do you think of this?" You know, I asked somebody else before I said that. Before I hit send, I make sure I read that real close. Email, I think maybe somebody can relate to that. What's that product that you take? Uh, what is it? When you send an email, you can send, you can be tracked right away. There's a product that might be one I need to give. Them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was uh, interested when you, <coughs> when you brought up raising lesson rates to, yes. to reduce your hours. And, and in, in two instances, uh, one in the 80s and one uh, more recently, uh, directors of tennis that I've been associated with uh, raised their lesson rates in an effort to reduce their hours on the court. And, and uh, they, had, they had waiting lists and all this other kind of stuff. They're good pros. And in both instances, when they raised their lesson rates, it, it, nobody went away that created the perception that they were worth it, they were good, and, and, and then they even had, had uh, uh, larger waiting lists. So this whole business of us, of us uh, uh, getting our value on the court, think about that, think about how much you charge, think about what your market will bear, uh, and and, and uh, uh, think about your own uh, professional qualities and worth, and, and 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 don't sell yourself on the cheap. Well, I think that's excellent advice, and th th every business has cost of living increases. Yeah. If you don't do that for your own business, then you're shortchanging yourself. Yeah. Oh. Now talking about raising prices for lessons, <coughs> what do you think? Should you raise? prices more often during the years or just once and then forget about it? No, I, I think it should be done on a regular basis, but at the same time every, every, uh, and also I have options, you know, I have, I have a staff of pros and there's different uh, market levels. If, if someone doesn't want to spend that kind of money, well, I have 
I have a person who can they can take lessons from at that level. But if they want a lesson with me, then I'm going to put myself at the top of the level. So you, as long as you give them that option, but I wouldn't do it several times during the year because people get upset. I would, I would just like anything, that when you pay your dues, it goes up 2%. And we you have to be able to, to do that on a regular basis. We yeah. have, um, my wife actually, you know, we take the kids to our day daycare. And for the past two years or three years, they've been told, we've been told every year that they're raising prices. And I say, how much are they raising? One dollar. So one dollar to five. I mean, we're, we're fine with that. It's, it doesn't bother us so much. So we pay $20 a day or $10. Like, oh, we're sorry, but we increased the price this year. Like from 20 to 21, so I would with that. Right. It does, but, but you, again, you're teaching the people how to to, to treat you, and, and just like any business, each year things cost more. Yeah, you have to you have to teach it. If you never do it, then that's what their expectation will be. This gentleman, that one, that I can certainly relate to everything you've said. I've been in this job a really, really long time. Up the end, but this is so good because I can take all these things back and hand it to three pros under me, oh, which I've been wanting to tell them, but it'll be coming from you. <laughs> so it's just perfect. And uh, I mean, uh, uh, 41 might be just uh, be on time and be prepared. I know you was talking about being professional, but gosh, the, the young people just, <coughs> they got cardio tennis, they put the machine out there at the time instead of before. And if, if I got cardio tennis at 12 and I got to go down to 12, I'm putting that machine out there at 15 to 9. You know, so anyway, just be prepared, <coughs> be professional. Great, great, great talk. Well, to your point, thank you. Uh, I had one pro that was habitually late, and I, and I told him, I said, look, you, this can't happen anymore. For now on, if you're not here, but at least five minutes before the lesson starts, you're teaching it for free. And, you know, he taught a couple for free, and they decided to be on time for it. <laughs> <laughs> if you're on time, you're late. Yeah, yeah bro. Brad, you had a comment? Well, I just wanted to um, address what Bo was saying. Where we are, we, we raise rates every three years. So you're not, they don't feel like you're nickeling down them every year. And then you go, you know, a 10% rate, like you charge 50, you go to 55. And that way, you know, you just say cost of living increase or what have you. And we haven't had any problems with that um, over the, my club in there 12 years. So. It's worked very well for us. Because, uh, you know, I think if you go every year, they, they just think you're nickel and dime. And if you do it every three years, then they just go, oh, you know, that's it. I just had a question when he was saying the machine, it reminded me about something. Um, what are your thoughts about using ball machines as opposed to feeding? Like, I personally use them all the time because I like to, especially if I've got a group of people working on strokes, I like to be able to get, pull one out while the other ones are hitting, put it back in fix whatever, if it's their grip, if it's their follow through, if their <laughs> elbows are the point where I'm on the point at the end. And I know, like I've got a new head pro and he never uses ball machines, probably because he's never had them. And I've got three playmates, I've got a serve lift. I love being able to put the kids out there and say, okay, we're gonna work on returns of serves and put some heavy top shit on them, that type of thing. I think ball machines are a revenue, revenue producing tool just like anything else. Yeah. And, uh, the or you invest in them, you're just going to increase your revenues. Whether you have to use it for teaching, whether you use it for ball machine club, it's just another line item that you can, uh, a tangent or a concession that you can increase your profits. So I am a big no, I'm, I'm talking about during lessons. Right. And yeah. I, but, but see, people won't use them unless they first see how it's right. used and they see it how it's used in a right. lesson. And then they'll also rent it. Let's so give Tom a hand, everybody. do a quick drawing. I'm going to then uh, have Brett Swartz uh, give, share a, a message with us uh, from USTA Southern. Brett is now on the board of directors. And Brett, you're going to stay actually right there. So as Mike sets up here, you can kind sure. of, the room can kind of look your way. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do, uh, numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, sorry, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 
26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, all the way to the back, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39. 39 it is. So the first thing we're going to give away is uh, Manuel's book. So hopefully Manuel doesn't win this. So uh, I think that's a good one. So I have 39, right? Sorry, I'm, I'm a slacker. I didn't have my random number generator going. So uh, one is our, our low number, and 39 is our higher number. And I'm going to do uh, non repeating. Let's do. Uh, okay, so the first person that wins Manuel's copy of his book is number 28. Oh! Huh? Is he pass that it's back? It's an evil book. It's an evil book. Okay. Uh, it's an evil. Is that down the next person yeah. is going to win this cool little uh, USBTA bag, and that is number 19. Number 19. It's somewhere over here. On 19. They should get a winter book. Put your books in it. DVD, Kinder Heart 20 Best Games for Teaching Strategy and Tactics. Where everybody saying, oh, I want that. Uh, number 24. Yes. Oh, oh you're 25. You're 23. I was 24 twice. Oh, I'm sorry, with ball machines. Yes. Um, yeah. with ball machines. And this will go to number 20. That's our bag, and our, it's got a flashlight and some other stuff in it. Number 20. Yep. Wow. Okay. Cool. And then we have a, a subscription to Craig's site. We have a subscription to Craig's site, and I'll have to write your name down here. That will go to number 12. Oh, so that's not too many. It's uh, Chris Puppet. <laughs> yeah. okay. He's going to end up emailing you something. Okay, um, let's turn it over to Brett. And um, Brett's got some pretty cool stuff to share with us. And I'm going to let Mike come in and start the setup up here. Good morning. Hold on, Pat. Don't go anywhere. Oh, I'd like to thank Pat and the board for putting on such a great conference for us over here. Winter convention I've been to, and it's really been great. I gotta tell you, thank I go, God I go, to, a, I go to a lot of them. They put a lot of hard work into this to make this come off. So thank you very much. Thank you, Brent. Thanks for the time here. Um, the USTA Southern. We have two. Uh, I'll give you a quick history of. We sold the BB and T tournament, um, and with the profits that we made, we're reinvesting those into tennis, and two initiatives. Uh, one of them is a play it forward initiative, and one of them is a build it forward initiative. Um, the Play It Forward initiative, uh, if, if you go to the USTA Southern website, it's the first thing that comes up on the home page. Um, but I'm, I'll, I'll just read a couple sentences to you so I don't uh, mix any of the verbiage up here. USTA Southern is looking for providers to partner with to increase participation in tennis with a focus on attracting and retaining new tennis players. These, these programs that we're, we're looking to attract have to be profitable. And when I say they have to be profitable, that is right in our wheelhouse. So I mean, anybody can do these programs, CTAs, state associations, it doesn't matter. But as tennis professionals, we're looking to make profit. These are programs that will help you set up. We'll give you seed money to set them up until they become profitable. And then you can go off.